Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, last but not least, in unserem siebten Slot kommen wir zu einem Thema, das auch schon eine gewisse Tradition hat. Ich habe gerade mit Herrn Böhmkes gesprochen, er meinte, es ist schon die sechste Veranstaltung. Ich habe ihn schon dreimal in den letzten Jahren moderiert. Es geht um neue Herausforderungen, sowohl für etablierte als auch für entstehende Reiseziele im Gay and Lesbian Tourism. Wir werden also aktuelle Marktdaten erfahren, wir werden Best-Practice-Beispiele sehen und das alles wird moderiert in bewährter Weise von Herrn Böhmkes. Ich freue mich, dass Sie da sind. Yes, hello. So good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I know it's a little bit late on Friday afternoon, but I hope uh, you are uh, still awake a little bit and uh, I think you're really interested in, in the gay and lesbian uh, tourism here. Yes, my name is Thomas Bamkes. I'm from Diversity Tourism. We are um, a consulting marketing agency based in Munich, Germany, and we are the LGBT consultant for ITB Berlin uh, since a few years and we are uh, doing uh, the Gay and Lesbian Pavilion in Hall 3.1 here at ITB Berlin. We're doing a Pink Pavilion at ITB Asia in Singapore every year. And we're also doing ITB Academies and conferences uh, with ITB uh, worldwide, like in Brazil, in India, planning one in Japan. So we, are, we and ITB are really active to uh, promote LGBT tourism around the world. Yesterday, ITB uh, signed a contract, a, strate a strategic partnership contract with uh, the new uh, tourism minister of Argentina. And Argentina is one of our uh, uh, partners now and globally to promote LGBT tourism. We had two other strategic partners already. That is the city of Berlin and the city of Vienna, who also signed a strategic partnership agreement with ITB Berlin a few years ago already. Yes, um, our company, we are doing uh, strategic consulting, marketing um, worldwide. We are doing this for LGBT tourism, but we are also active in golf tourism, medical tourism, and um, shopping tourism, which is brand new with us. So we are quite in, in niche markets a little bit. So, but I mean, you want to contact me, have a question, got, you can got me at tb at diversitytourism.com. So today we have, I think, a few interesting panelist speakers here for you. We have uh, Peter Jordan from Toposophy. He worked for UNW in, uh, UNWTO in Madrid for a very long time. We have Tom Ross here from Community Marketing, very specialized in LGBT tourism uh, marketing market uh, service. He will give you some update information about the Chinese market, for example. And we have one of our best practice uh, examples and partners here is um, from the Vienna Tourist Board. So first, we start with, uh, with Peter Jordan from Toposophy. And he's from, based in Amsterdam. And he will give you introduction into our topic for today, the new challenges for established and emerging destinations in gay and lesbian tourism. So Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, and I um, wanted to say, first of all, a couple of congratulations. Congratulations to ITB on this 50th anniversary. Uh, congratulations, Thomas, for putting all of this together, because I know it involves a lot of hard work uh, doing this kind of thing. Um, and uh, it's also quite an honor for me to be here, because uh, I have been to ITB, I think, four, I think this is my fifth ITB, uh, and I've, uh, whenever I can, I always try to join the audience in this session on the Friday afternoon about LGBT tourism. And um, for me, it's quite an honor then to, to be here uh, speaking on the stage. I've been working in a lot of different areas um, over the last few years as a consultant, and I find this an especially interesting sector of the global travel and tourism sector to, to concentrate on, uh, precisely because it's so innovative, um, and also because you make a lot of good friends working in LGBT tourism, uh, as I know. But um, what I wanted to do with my presentation, this opening presentation, was to um, perhaps open your eyes to some of the the challenges and some of the opportunities that are appearing uh, in LGBT tourism right now. And also, I think, to help uh, raise some serious questions that uh, we'll be debating in the panel afterwards. <clears throat> but before I go on, I wanted to uh, just tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I am uh, 
uh, mostly a specialist in millennial traveler trends, and I've been watching very closely as I travel myself and as I do um, a lot of research into how millennials are shaping the future of the travel and tourism industry. Um, and I think there's obviously a lot that we can talk about when it comes to LGBT tourism as well. Uh, I've authored uh, several reports uh, about millennials um, and also other areas which are quite cutting edge right now. Um, obviously the emerging markets, uh, I've been doing some work with the Pacific Asia Travel Association, uh, recently produced a couple of reports about Asian travelers and uh, also the sharing economy. There's also a relationship there actually with LGBT travelers too and, um, and obviously on LGBT travel and um, I don't know if some of you may have seen a report produced by the World Tourism Organization uh, this was produced in 2012, um, and I was very fortunate to be working on that when I was working at UNWTO. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that I'm now working with the IGLTA Foundation and the UNWTO to uh, produce a second report which is going to go into much more depth about the future of emerging markets and destinations uh, in LGBT travel. So I actually think that's quite a major step ahead that this, that organization is interested in working in this area. Um, so, um, Toposophy, I, maybe you haven't heard of the company, but uh, in a very short space of time, we've been doing a lot of very big things. We're a destination marketing agency uh, serving all sectors of, of the tourism industry, uh, and we, uh, work, we provide the services that tourism boards and travel bans really need. Um, I say they really need because we're also part of a, a digital agency. So we're part of a digital agency called Atcom, um, and uh, very pleased to say that we were winner already of the Red Dot Marketing Award, a very prestigious award for design. Just take a look at our website and you'll see why. Um, but, uh, and we're also, just one thing, other thing I wanted you to know is that we are uh, the official research partner of European Cities Marketing, helping them and their members um, through some of the major questions that are happening in the travel industry right now. But enough about me and enough about the, the company, because um, I wanted to sort of outline some of the big questions that we're going to be talking about in the panel today and helping you to sort of really gain a big picture of, uh, of what's happening in the industry right now. Um, we have several uh, big themes that we're going to be talking about. The, the emergence of new products and new destinations, the emergence of new outbound markets, asking you, uh, are you really where the action is in LGBT tourism right now? And then talking about some of the challenges for mature destinations um, and, and how they can move forward. So, <clears throat> first of all, moving on quickly, new products and new destinations. Um, I think, just as in the global travel and tourism sector as a whole, there has been an enormous diversification of products that are available for, uh, for travelers to engage in, and also, of course, increasing number of destinations. I think when you stop somebody in the street who's not necessarily uh, identifies with L, G, B, or T, um, and you ask them, mm, what do you think of when you think of gay travel? Well, I think that perhaps some, these are sometimes the images that come to mind uh, pretty quickly. Um, the same happens to me too, but this is how I think traditionally has been the reality, but I think if we look at the modern reality, it's actually something far more nuanced and something far more varied um, because we really are seeing a huge diversification in the products and services that gay travelers are consuming uh, when they travel around. It's a lot more nuanced because the visibility and the variety of gay people, of course, is changing in society. It's, it's emerging enormously and I think there's many more um, subsectors, let's say, of the LGBT uh, consumer audience that we're starting to see. So, what's driving this diversification? What's behind it? Well, as I was saying before, I think there's a rising, what I call the rising tide of, of global travel. Um, in general, travel products, destinations are becoming more varied. Travelers are reaching more corners of the globe today. And it's only natural and it's only right that gay travelers are looking for similar experiences when they travel as well. Um, but perhaps something more suited to their needs and to their interests. Of course, LGBT travelers, like everybody else, are becoming more adventurous and, of course, as we all know, much better connected, much, able to find out, much better able to find out about these experiences as well. Um, I think the spread of marriage equality, for me, um, and I'd be interested to get the opinion of the panelists as well on this, for me, it's probably the strongest signal um, for a, that a country has changed and a country has progressed and, um, and that things are different. And I think, it's, I think there are many people here today coming from countries where this has happened. Uh, and when there is a change in the law, then obviously the tourism industry will find a way of, uh, of exploiting that and making the most of it. 
Um, of course, as I was saying before, the di fortunately, the diversity, diversity of LGBT people is becoming much better reflected in society. Um, so um, it's now possible to get much more personal in your marketing and in your product development to ensure that you really are adjusting what you have to what LGBT customers really need. And then there's, of course, what uh, Skift called the rise of the silent traveler. It's this traveler that never really interacts very much with personally with customer service representatives, but it's somebody who is always doing their homework online, travels with their mobile device, and finds new opportunities by themselves, and eventually LGBT uh, travel products and services. Okay, when we look at this, new markets, new rules. This is something which I think we really need to consider, and I, I'm sure we're going to get on to discussing this in far more detail later today. Uh, when I say new markets, I'm talking about new outbound markets, okay? So I think one of the things we really have to consider here, one of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest factors, is the, the fact that there are really very different uh, social attitudes and expectations. Why do I say expectations? Well, look at what I'm talking about here. The influence of the family, of peers, so that's friends and work colleagues, um, the government and religion. And there's actually a reason why I put the list in that order. Because when we're looking at, for example, the emerging outbound markets of Asia, I think we quickly discover that, you know, unlike in Europe and, and North America, where the government and religion perhaps have um, caused problems for gay people, make life uncomfortable or publicly, um, actually, I think there's a different value system at work in the Asian outbound markets. Of course, this varies very much around the world, but again, these are the value systems that affect. Uh, the things that consumers do and the decisions that make as consumers. So as people who do the marketing, it's important for us to understand them. And again, it's of course very important to understand really the motivations. What are the consumer motivations in emerging markets? Are they necessarily what they think they are, what we think they are? I think um, when we think of, we talk, we talk about emerging markets, they have that name for a reason. They're emerging because people are working hard, they're emerging rapidly as economic powers. Um, people, consumers are constantly looking to show off their prestige, show their status, move up the social ladder. And I think that that's perhaps more exaggerated than we're finding in the reality of life in Western Europe right now. Okay, of course, as we also knew, I think some of you who are already working in some of these markets, um, new markets, new rules, well, there are also new communication channels and very different communication channels when we're doing our marketing to those that we're traditionally used to. Um, so there's very different types of messaging that you can use. Um, just for an example, obviously, we, we, I know many of you are aware of uh, the change of the law in China, I think it was just last week, about the types of messaging that can be used and the type of portrayal of, of uh, gay people in, in public life. Um, and so there are different types of content that are acceptable. But when I say that, I think it's important to bear in mind at the same time that we must never make assumptions about these markets. It's very easy to watch the news um, and get depressed uh, sometimes about the reality of life for gay people in different parts of the world, in some developing countries. But at the same time, um, I'd like to say that it's perhaps never as bad as we, not always as bad as we might think. It's not always ex as exaggerated as we might think. So how to get past this? Well, I encourage all of you to travel as much as possible. Go to the markets that you're interested in. Talk to people. Meet as wide a range of people as possible and really understand their value systems and understand what motivates them as consumers. So on that note, I wanted to ask, well, you know, are we here right now where the action is in terms of the global flows of tourists and the global flows of LGBT tourists? Because um, there are, of course, a number of uh, new, let's say, uh, hubs of, of gay life around the world. Um, there are many more than this, of course. I only just had the opportunity to put these, uh, just a few together, a few examples. Um, but uh, we've got Tel Aviv in the Middle East, Cape Town in South Africa, um, where I'm happy to be going for the first time next month for the IGLTA convention. And, the, uh, and then, of course, uh, Taipei. I'm sure we've seen some pictures of Taipei Gay Pride, um, which looks very exciting. Um, and there are, of course, many others as well. Um, but yes, it's not just, I think it's very easy for us to feel sometimes that we're at the center of the universe, but it's not necessarily the case. So, this is my recommendation then, is let's think about these regional hubs of gay life around the world, and then think about how your product, your destination, or your service is represented there. 
um, how do consumers in those locations view what you're doing um, and view your own marketing? Um, what, do they, what do those places represent for the people, LGBT people, who are visiting? Do they represent a safe haven? Do they represent a place for a good night out? Do they represent a future place to live? These are all important questions to consider when you're thinking of marketing to the new uh, gay audience. Um, and then, of course, there's this thing, what we call the travel career. Think back to when you started traveling. On your first trip overseas, did you get on a plane and fly 12 hours to go to a long-haul destination? I didn't. I went I'm from the UK. The first foreign country I've ever went to was France. Um, and over time, I got more and more adventurous. I traveled further and further. But just, of course, think about if you're growing up in Hong Kong, it's unlikely that as your first ever trip, perhaps you, you've, you've got a partner, a young partner, and you want to take a trip for the first time, you're probably not going to get on a plane and go all the way to Paris. You may do eventually, but just think about, of course, the travel career that people build up and where you are on those, that priority list. And it's with that in mind that I wanted to just share an insight from a piece of research that I did on young Asian travelers. I'm talking generally, I'm not talking specifically about LGBT travelers, but about dream destinations. This is in a publication that I did with the Pacific Asia Travel Association uh, called The Rise of the Young Asian Traveler. And we asked this question. So, if time and money were not an issue, where would your dream destination be in the next 10 years? And these were the results. Okay, now <clears throat> perhaps some of you it might not be a surprise, some of you it might be more surprising, but I have an important question for this audience. Do these, destina do these destinations necessarily change because the young consumer is gay or lesbian? They probably still have this ambition to go to France or go to the United States or Australia, Japan or Italy or all the other countries that were listed in this survey, but you have to think. Um, uh, is their choice of destination necessarily going to be defined by their sexuality? And then we get on to, of course, this uh, big question of for the mature destinations, and I know that many of you will be joining us from, let's say, some of... When I saw, say mature, I'm not talking in age, I'm talking in, uh, in terms of their popularity as gay destinations, as established gay destinations. Um, I think there's going to be an increasing challenge uh, in, the next, in the next 5, 10, 15 years of talking about their relevance to the gay market. How do you stay relevant? How do you in ensure that gay travelers are going to continue to come back and engage with you? Well, perhaps as a start to answering these questions, we have to think about um, you know, what made them popular as gay destinations in the first place. The availability of, of, of gay uh, retailers and um, hotels and shops and, of course, nightlife, um, and I mean that in every sense of the word. Um, you know, we have to think about what made those popular. And then we think about, okay, in making them relevant, are those elements, especially, for example, nightlife, um, are those necessarily going to be this attractive in the, to the same extent to emerging market travelers? I think those are some of the tough questions we need to ask. Um, and then, of course, we talk about millennials, an area that I study all the time. Um, how about coming face to face? Uh, how are you going to present a, f a fresh face to the millennial market? How are you going to constantly come up with new products and services and exciting new events that are going to keep this market engaged? Because surely, of course, these days in Western Europe, North America, aren't they all gay friendly? That's a rhetorical question. But um, of course, uh, this, is what I, this is why I ask are all destinations necessarily? Um, are, you, are the travel brands necessarily reflecting what matters to young LGBT people today? That's how you stay relevant. Are you reflecting the full diversity of LGBT people? Because by reflecting that diversity, that's personalization. We hear that word all the time in the travel industry, personalization. Well, um, reflecting the diversity, reflecting your customer in what you're doing, understanding who they are, and their needs and their aspirations, that is personalization. Um, and of course, there's a huge diversity now in how LGBT people want to travel, traveling with their own children, traveling with their parents, with their grandparents, with their cousins, um, all together in a group. Um, but it's understanding how to reach that customer and influence them um, and understand that they might not always be traveling alone or in a couple. And then, of course, the challenge of staying social, local, and mobile as well when you're trying to reach millennials. And it's uh, at this point that I reach the end of my presentation by asking, actually, 
a more broader question. Stepping back from the area of LGBT travel, um, there's a, I wanted to sort of throw, throw a grenade into this debate, really, and sort of share with you a perspective that I have, is that people who work in destination authorities, I think in emerging or um, established markets, they don't lay awake at night worrying about whether um, they're going to continue to be relevant to gay consumers. They worry about these things. These are the challenges that keep people who work in tourism authorities awake at night. They worry about how you're going to match that experience with the marketing promise, because if you don't, then people will complain, and you'll see it all across social media. How can you ensure good quality accommodation, exciting new propositions for the consumer? How can you spread that visitor spending out from the center? That's the subject of a report that I've just done, again, on, on, on Asian travelers and how you do this. It's a fascinating area. There's, of course, public-private cooperation, sharing and creating new experiences, this new element of the sharing economy. But it's not all doom and gloom, because what I would like to propose is that as providers in the LGBT travel industry, you all have a possibility, almost a responsibility, to provide solutions for these areas. To stay relevant, to stay active, to stay in business, I think you have to be able to cooperate well with authorities and help them solve these problems. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, and say thank you to Thomas. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So our next speaker will be uh, Tom Roth from Community Marketing San Francisco. What can Tom? So here you come. Right here. So we look for. Yeah. Hi everyone. Thank you very much for being here. So I like to look at the challenges less as challenges and more as opportunities. Not working. Where am I pointing? I think straight to the back. Should I use this? There we go. So what'd you do? Okay, now it's working. So challenges are opportunities. When we look at differences, when we look at specialization, when we look at um, obstacles, we can see them as hurdles or blocks in terms of where we want to go, or we can say, hmm, I see an opportunity there. So that's what I want to talk about today. So first of all, thank you very much to Thomas and to ITB. We are the official LGBT research partner of uh, ITB and the ITB Academy. We've done presentations before, we've done um, webinars, etc. A little bit about my company. Uh, we've been around for 23 years. We started in 1992, uh, before most destinations were interested in the LGBT market. In fact, when we first started, we had two clients. One was Quebec, the uh, province of Quebec in Canada, and the other was Netherlands Board of Tourism. So we started with those two. Now we work with about 60 or 70 DMOs and destination uh, operators around the world. And we provide full service market research. So these are just the, some, uh, some of the logos of the destinations that we've had the privilege of working with over the years. So that's kind of a little bit of our background. We also work with hotels and airlines and other uh, kinds of companies. So what I want to talk about today are three different things. First of all is that concept of not a challenge, but an opportunity. Looking at the diversity within LGBT as opportunities to be maybe even first to market. You know, when, when uh, we first started working with Montreal and Quebec in 1993, they were really first to market. They made huge waves in the tourism and hospitality industry and the LGBT community by being the first to say, not we don't want gay people, but we want gay people. That's huge. And that was a very, very newsworthy thing that happened, and now many destinations, of course. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we look at diversity through our research and our approaches to research, and then I want to finish off with a case study, which is Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And it's a great case study because they are a longtime marketer to the LGBT community, but they're also brand new to the LGBT community, and I'll explain what that means. So first of all, diversity within LGBT. I believe that's where the opportunity is. We can look at the diversity in LGBT and say, 
it's too difficult to reach the, the LGBT community, or maybe we approach the LGBT community as one thing, which of course we are not. There really is no gay market, okay? So those of you who are new to this segment, you may think, okay, well, there's this market and this market and the gay market and other markets. There is no gay market. There isn't even an LGBT market as a singular market because we are as diverse as the entire world's population. And that's a really important principle to remember. We love golf, we love tennis, we love swimming, we love hiking, we love theater, we love parasailing, we love mountain climbing. We love it all because we're as representative of the mainstream as any segment would be. And that's really important to know because you may think your destination oh, may not be valid for the LGBT market because we don't have gay bars or we don't have gay pride, okay? Or we don't have gay cruises. But that's not really everything. The real opportunity is really identifying what the interests are and approaching those interests and offering those interests. So really recognizing the diversity within LGBT is the key to success. So here's an example from our research. Every year for the past 20 years, we've provided an LGBT tourism study. This is available for free off of our website, and I know you're all taking pictures and notes. If you want to give me your card at the end, I'll send you this whole presentation, as well as a link to download the research. But we ask, what kind of traveler are you? And this is about uh, 6,000 LGBT travelers. And the most popular motivation, of course, is warm weather. Everybody loves warm weather. But when you start to look at differences, we find that gay men are far more interested in urban destinations than lesbians. And we find that in terms of outdoor and active adventure, lesbians are far more interested than gay men. And if you think about that for a moment, that's kind of the opposite of the general market because you think women want to go shopping, they want to go to the spa, they want to stay in a nice hotel, but in the LGBT community, it's the men that want to do that. And you think of outdoor adventure, you think of men, they want to put on their boots, they want to put on their backpacks, they want to go biking, they want to go hiking, but in the LGBT market, it's the lesbians who want to do that. So don't make assumptions. Look at the opportunities within LGBT, not LGBT as a singular market. I think demographically it's really interesting to see what's going on as well. There's a whole emerging LGBT family market. We found that 31% of Generation X, the sort of middle range of the lesbian community, have children living at home. So 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we never really thought about the LGBT family market, but now it's something that's emerging. But wait, because in the next generation, half of men and half of women plan to have children. Again, 10 years ago, before marriage equality, which, which Peter mentioned, we weren't thinking about having a marriage, a wedding. We weren't thinking about raising a family. But younger people think, why not? My friends are. I should too. The other thing that's happening is that the older generation of LGBTs who may have children from a heterosexual wedding or marriage, now their children are having children and there's a whole emerging grandchildren market. So gay men and women and their grandchildren are traveling together. So we look at these as opportunities. One of our clients is the Walt Disney Company, and they're all about having these older gays and lesbians bring their grandkids to Disney. Makes a lot of sense. So they look at the opportunities there. So how do we approach this challenge or opportunity of diversity? First of all, we've developed a panel. A panel is like a database of LGBT community members who will interact with our surveys. So we take surveys for a wide variety of destinations because even two destinations can't really assume that they're going to have the same markets and the same kind of communications. So we look at markets within LGBT, gay men and lesbians, older and younger, the different ethnicities within LGBT, the different regions, the different family structures. We match those to the opportunities in travel. Consumer travel, who thought of business travel? Meetings are a huge segment of LGBT that most are completely overlooking. Conferences, LGBT events, 
20 to 25 percent of LGBTs travel to another city to experience a pride event. That's a huge movement of people. But most destinations aren't partnering with their pride events to create more inbound travel. And the average stay at one of those prides is four nights. So it's not just that they go for the day and come back, they're spending four nights. Anyway, we look at the different opportunities within travel, we look at the different communication channels, and we try and create a map of where to go. So I want to finish off with this case study. Fort Lauderdale, Florida is a great case study. They emerged into the LGBT marketplace 20 years ago. And through the years, they've constantly reinvented themselves. So a seasoned destination doesn't make any assumptions that we can just be a gay destination forever. They constantly have to reinvent because we're always looking for something new. So because they are always looking for something new, they're getting a lot of press. First of all, I want to talk about something we're very proud of, which is the first ever study on transgender travelers. Many of us talk about LGBT, but we very rarely look at the L, the G, the B, and the T. The B in LGBT is the largest segment of LGBT. Nobody's talking about B. The T is often overlooked, ignored, and there's a lot of opportunity there. So from our panel, we have 1,500 transgender community members in our USA panel. We did a study for Fort Lauderdale, and we found many different really interesting points. Not way too much to try and cover in a very short amount of time here, but I encourage you to download this to really understand the opportunities. So based on the research, we helped their advertising department create the first ever ad campaign of a destination that welcomed explicitly the transgender community. They also have a special URL. It's sunny.org, but in the case of the LGBT community, for the transgender community, they changed it, which I thought was very clever, to TLGB, to really emphasize transgender. This is the microsite within their Fort Lauderdale website. It's specifically about transgender opportunities and issues. If you click on English, it drops down to many different languages, which you can translate the site into. If you click on German, it translates the site into German. Fascinating. They're such a great case study. They're doing, honestly, they're doing everything right. They're authentically transgender friendly. A lot of transgender people were concerned about their safety and security and what are the resources that we have when we go to a destination. So, on the website, they have the resources listed there. They actually have a letter from the sheriff's office, the police department, welcoming transgender people and saying, we'll do everything we can to make you feel safe. This is genuine. This is authentic. Really not just saying LGBT, but very specifically addressing the transgender travelers. We also found that a majority of transgender travelers go to conferences. So Fort Lauderdale went after the largest transgender conference in the USA. It had been in Atlanta for 24 years, year after year. Fort Lauderdale won that business and brought the conference to Fort Lauderdale, and now it will be in Fort Lauderdale forever. And this gives a lot of credibility to the destination. Let me talk about a new case study we just did for them, the family traveler. As I was talking about the emerging family market, well, Fort Lauderdale wanted to address this. They wanted to understand what are the opportunities in family travel. So, we did a study for them on the LGBT family traveler. And we identified the different motivations, the concerns, the challenges of families when they travel together. One thing we found was that when a gay couple travels someplace just alone, they're really interested in LGBT, right? They want to go to gay bars, they want to go to gay clubs, they want to stay in a gay hotel. Once they have kids, that changes everything. They want to go to family-friendly hotels, family-friendly destinations. They want to be sure that their children will be welcome. So things change. Fort Lauderdale came out with this great ad. I love the image, right? It just shows diversity. It shows the welcoming nature of the destination for families. And now they are getting some press about their approach to the family market. So they didn't look at these challenges. They didn't look at the 
changes within the LGBT demographic as a challenge that they couldn't overcome. They looked at it as opportunities. These are things we can do to remain relevant, to remain authentic, to remain top of mind. During the panel part, I also want to mention a few points we learned from our first ever China LGBT tourism study. This was breakthrough. Nobody has ever really covered the Chinese market. And the Chinese market is, if you think about it, the largest LGBT market in the world. Why? Because China is the largest everything in the world. And so when we look at the Chinese LGBT market, it really offers opportunities. So we have this available both in English and in Chinese. So as I finish up, a couple resources. One is to download surveys and studies off of our website. You have the community survey. Uh, we have an African-American LGBT study because we look at ethnicity within LGBT. We have the transgender study. We have the China study and many other studies. You can just download them for free. Also like to invite you to our own conference that will be in Las Vegas in December and to come to LGBT Week, which will be in New York next month, actually in, in May. We have an LGBT travel symposium in partnership with IGLTA. If you're not yet a, familiar with or a, a member of IGLTA, I strongly encourage getting involved in IGLTA as your first step when you move forward into the LGBT market. So you can just send me a quick email, tom at cmi.info, or leave me a business card at the end of this. I'll stay behind and be happy to send you a copy of this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. So our next speaker is uh, Thomas Bachinger from the Vienna Tourist Board, one of our best practice partners. Yes, um, hello also from my side. I'm with the Vienna Tourist Board, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we uh, address the LGBT travelers uh, to come to Vienna. And uh, after that, I want to go a little bit into detail how we do marketing um, in Eastern European countries. Um, So just a few seconds, he'll, he's working on that. So Tom, if you want, you can dance a little bit. Oh no! Is there a special I'm not Vienna a dance, dance, like a waltz? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, no, it's coming. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So well, we are an IGLTA member since um, 1997, and we do marketing in the gay and lesbian segment since 1998. And we hosted the first international press trip to Vienna to our annual rainbow um, parade, uh, Vienna Pride, in 1999. Uh, together with the Viennese uh, local magazine G, um, we uh, published a gay guide in the year 2000. And since the year 2002, we produced our own gay and lesbian guide. As well, uh, on our website, uh, we have our own microsite for gay and lesbian travelers to Vienna. And we're very proud, in 2014, we were voted the Gay City of the Year in the category Culture Hub uh, uh, by gay cities, by users of the website gaycities.com. Um, so in terms of marketing tools, what we are using, you see the Vienna Now and Never logo in uh, rainbow colors. So we have our own Vienna gay logo, which we use. Uh, on all marketing um, activities, publications. Uh, as mentioned, we have the Gay and Lesbian Guide uh, that's available in German and in English, and as of March this year, also in Italian and Japanese language. Um, I already mentioned our microsite on our main website, uh, which is available in 11 different languages, and we also have two Facebook pages uh, dedicated to the LGB LGBT traveler in German and English. Furthermore, we also, if you already visited us at our um, booth at the Gay and Lesbian Travel Pavilion in Hall 3.1, we have uh, also gay uh, and lesbian giveaways. So we have liquid bags, which are very useful for traveling. We have pens, notepads, bookmarks, fans, and here you can see our gay and lesbian guide. 
Furthermore, we also have key visuals, one addressing the gay travelers and the other one addressing the lesbian travelers, uh, which we use for um, magazine inserts, for example, and we also uh, produce uh, banners uh, for events, for example, with those. Um, in terms of um, markets where we're actively promoting Vienna as an LGBT-friendly destination, um, so our top two key markets are Germany and Austria, and then we also promote it in uh, so-called highly developed gay and lesbian markets, which are Great Britain, Italy, Switzerland, the US, Canada, Brazil, and this year the first time in Australia. You might have heard that Conchita Wurst was just last week uh, in Sydney giving a sold-out concert at the Sydney Opera House, and my colleague, uh, she was hosting a meet and greet and also a press uh, conference all um, around this concert. And then we also promote Vienna uh, in Japan, also this year, the first time in Poland and in Romania. Um, so there was a market research study executed in 2012, and one of the outcomes was that we are actually... Um, um, that lesbian and gays uh, should be handled as two different target groups. So where on the one side, the gay travelers really love the cultural offer and the imperial flair of the city of Vienna. The lesbian travelers also look into uh, or also really like the romantic aspect of the city. And therefore, there are different strategies for different markets, obviously. So uh, there are thematic focuses on different brand modules uh, in some countries. We uh, do marketing with the imperial heritage of Vienna. In other ones, we promote more the music and cultural offer. In third ones, we promote the Viennese cuisine or, for example, also Green Vienna. Um, in terms of activities, we do B2C, B2B online and press marketing activities. So as mentioned before, we're exhibiting here at the ITB Berlin and also at the ITB Asia. Uh, we are taking part in IGLT annual conventions. In 2013, um, for example, we were part of the Dare to Gay Travel catalog and we had our own truck at the Pride in Gran Canaria. In 2014, we were at the Gay Village during uh, Rome Pride. We were at the World Pride in Toronto and and we had a big cooperation with Gadio uh, during Vienna Pride Week. And uh, yeah, the hosts of the morning show came to Vienna and broadcasted live for two days during Pride. We also do a lot of online campaigns and online corporations, and also very important um, to really um, yeah, tell people how, how great Vienna is, is to bring them to Vienna. So we're hosting a lot of press trips or study groups, for example, to the annual Life Ball that we're hosting in Vienna, uh, Europe's largest HIV and, and AIDS charity event. Furthermore, to Vienna Pride and to the Rainbow Ball in January, which is one of the traditional balls in Vienna. And uh, obviously last year, 2015, we had Eurovision Song Contest in Vienna and we also hosted a large group of press and travel trade um, people to Vienna. So going into the Eastern European countries uh, now um, or this year, uh, we, want, uh, we are actively promoting Vienna in Poland and in Romania. And our goal is uh, obviously to position Vienna as a tolerant and exclusive culture hub for the LGBT community. And uh, therefore, there are um, regular press releases sent out on LGBT events in Vienna. Um, my colleagues are organizing press trips from Poland and Romania to uh, events in Vienna, as mentioned, uh, for example, Vienna Pride or the Rainbow Ball in Vienna. Uh, there's also cooperation with the LGBT Business Forum in Warsaw. And uh, most of the um, activities this year are um, online marketing activities. Uh, going back some years, for example, in 2013, in both countries, we actually hosted a, um, a B2B event. So in Warsaw and in Bucharest, uh, we invited opinion leaders from the LGBT community, politics, uh, media, and travel industry. And uh, as you can see, location-wise, we were in one uh, city at the Austrian Cultural Forum and in the other city at the Austrian Embassy. So here, there is also big support of the government of Austria in promoting promoting Vienna as a um, gay and lesbian friendly travel destination. So during these evenings, uh, there is Viennese entertainment, uh, Viennese waltz, Viennese dance, Viennese wine, Viennese food. And after that, uh, we hope for comprehensive media coverage. For example, this was in the Polish newspaper. We had an interview with our CEO, Norbert Kettner, and he was asked about 
Vienna and on the other side, uh, yeah, if Vienna was an open-minded city and on the other side it was compared to Warsaw. Uh, furthermore, uh, in terms of online marketing activities, you can see last year uh, a lot of uh, online activities with uh, Conchita Wurst in Poland and in Romania we had a lot of uh, banner placements on different Romanian LGBT websites. Um, Hungary and Czech Republic, uh, we were actively promoting Vienna until 2014 and uh, the reason why it ended was uh, that um, our, we have a strategic, uh, um, a strategic department uh, for strategic development um, in, in our company and uh, actually it was decided that all marketing activities never, uh, so um, LGBT and the regular travels to Vienna, uh, that all these activities um, are, so to say, finished because uh, my colleagues uh, thought that um, the, uh, the market is quite saturated in these two countries and that's why we don't have any real actual, actual budget to do any more marketing activities. But until 2014, uh, we also promoted uh, Vienna as an LGBT-friendly city uh, in Hungary and Czech Republic by press releases on LGBT events and press trips. But uh, yeah, the main part was actually also again online marketing activities. Um, yeah, well, if you have more questions, I'll be happy to answer them in terms of our work that we're doing, and um, thank you. So, thank you, Tom. So, now I want to introduce you to um, Ms. Rika Jean-Francois. She is the CSR Commissioner from ITB Berlin, and also in charge of the LGBT tourism here at ITB Berlin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm always very, very delighted to see still many people at Friday afternoon. That's always a challenge, so I'm very happy. Yeah, I'm, as Thomas said, the CSR Commissioner for ITB Berlin, and part of our uh, responsibility is also, of course, uh, fighting for diversity. So I'm very active and we have built up the LGBT segment actually here at ITB Berlin. And I'm also a proud member of IGLTA, which is the International Gay and Lesbian Association. I'm sure it was already mentioned. Um, and I'm also a member of the board of the IGLTA Foundation, which is also very important to have that foundation. Um, excuse me for coming now, but I was also fighting for women's rights next door because there was a seminar on gender equality in tourism and I really had to be there because this is also something where we really still lack a lot. So, um, ITB. Yeah, we have created, as I said, everybody knows that already, we have the Pink Pavilion, ITB, um, LGBT travel has become uh, a segment fully recognized like all the other segments. And um, we, try to, ooh, we try to educate, we try to raise awareness internationally. So with Tom Montour and uh, other friends from the industry, Tom Roth and uh, Peter, of course, Thomas, we've been in Vienna as well. We do a lot to educate and to raise awareness because, you know, you have heard now in the new reports and surveys that um, things are going on well, that we have... Um, oh, I think we are on the wrong page, but it doesn't matter. No, that's okay. Oh, so I'll talk like that, doesn't matter. So we have seen that it goes on very well, that uh, a lot of destinations open up for the gay market, and um, um, there's a new trend for segments within the segment. You know, I'm sure you talked also about this uh, cruises and f rainbow travel families and a lot of events where also women start to travel on now because it's a new generation of travelers, also LGBT tra travelers, who do not always want to have their own um, infrastructure but want to travel with non-gay friends, you know. So things are changing and there's a lot of uh, very positive uh, development. But, and that's why I'm mainly here now because you talked about all this already. Um, on the other hand, there are still a lot of destinations where we cannot travel um, as what we are. 
We have to hide our sexual identity, and this is a problem in many countries. And that's why I think it's so great that Vienna is also entering in the Eastern European market, because sometimes only some words and some explanations really help people to understand what it is all about. That it's not about sex tourism, not more or less than in a hetero uh, travel uh, segment. So um, this is one thing which is very important. But on the other hand, I, th I think we still have to not to forget this human rights issue, that in many countries it is not possible, and have to see how we can uh, unite to get into these markets as well. And I'm very happy that also with the IGLTA, you know, signing, um, EPATA signing the IGLTA, which is the Pacific Asian Travel Association, you know, putting an emphasis on Asian, because Asia is not so easy if it comes to welcoming LGBT travelers openly. But it, these are very intelligent people as well, so I just think it needs a little bit of awareness. So I'm also very happy to have uh, our friends from Japan here, coming since four years already, and yeah, we will hopefully, I, I think I can already say that, do something, have an ITB Academy in Tokyo as well, to talk about our issue and also about our fight for human rights and tourism. So, yeah, because we also have to understand, and that's the last slide, I just wanted to tell everybody that even in LGBT-friendly travel destinations, visibility does not automatically translate to equality. And this is because we tend to say we should only look at the developing countries or Asia or Africa, which is difficult to, um, uh, to, to, to be there as an LGBT traveler. But it's also still in many countries of Europe or where people say, OK, there is visibility, but we have to fight for equality. And I really am a strong believer of education, because once you understand, you, will, you cannot hate or discriminate. You know, nobody was born hating. Nobody. And it's just about explaining what it is all about. And we have support. We have support from the UNWTO. We have support from the UN Human Rights Council. There is a UN resolution against um, anti-LGBT uh, violence. So, and I was also very happy to hear lately that the Asian People's Forum, they also um, started lobbying, you know, for LGBT rights. So, yeah, I think we can move forward. We can educate, advocate, and create awareness. And we will do that in South Africa. I don't know if that has been said already. Cape Town is waiting first time. An IGLTA Congress is going to happen in Africa, in Cape Town. And that's also a very important milestone. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you, Rika. So I think this was already quite interesting. I would want to talk a little about the challenges now here for emerging and well-established destinations. So Peter, what do you, uh, what do you think uh, when it comes to marketing challenges for uh, established, uh, established destinations like Vienna? So how do, or, or for Lauderdale, that we had a good example from for Lauderdale already, what are, how can they find niche in the niche market? We see for Lauderdale and Vienna here on one side, totally different destinations and what works for, for for Lauderdale, maybe not works for Vienna, and we have when we have other destinations. So, what are the marketing challenges here? Well, there's a big question for very late on a Friday afternoon, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, um, well, first, first of all, congratulations for the work that you do because it's clearly important, and it was also clearly reaching a public that needs to see it as well uh, in the in the emerging destinations, and also to help um, travellers. Though, of course, in the US, it's an it's an advanced, it's a very mature market, it's an advanced uh, destination in that respect, but uh, you're still doing uh, good work in helping different segments of the LGBT travel industry to, to travel comfortably and, and of course travel safely. Um, with regards to the more general challenges, um, I have a firm belief um, that when we need to, in, in terms of our conversation that we're having with destination authorities, helping to advise them, helping to, to lobby them, um, I think that 
uh, I'd like to sort of go back to the, the slide that I put at the end of my presentation and talk about the more general challenges that destinations have, because again, those are the things that I think really keep them awake at night. And yet I really believe that there is a, an opportunity here for all providers in the LGBT travel industry to help pr propose solutions and to help provide solutions on uh, tackling uh, aspects like seasonality. So a lot of destinations in Europe suffer from, from seasonality, a high season and a low season. And so, for example, through LGBT business events, and Tom talked about the importance of those, and business networks, well, organizing events that help to tackle um, things like that. If you come to your tourism board with solutions, um, then I think you'll find a really good reception. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it comes down to helping to tackle some of the broader problems um, that exist in destination management uh, as well. Mm, and what is it, uh, the difference to emerging destinations? What do you see there? Well, with emerging destinations, of course, as I think, I think the important thing there to bear in mind um, is, as I was saying, about the fact that there really are sort of new rules, different sets of value systems, and that means, of course, you have to do your homework. You have to get some good research under your belt before you're going to rush in <laughs> for you, and there are others available, I understand. Um, but, um, yeah, you, you, I think it means doing your homework. Uh, it means really understanding which value systems are, are available, um, and of course, um, in the end, having the courage to go for that market, to, under, to, to really have the courage to go into new markets, um, go, go there, talk to people who are, talk to the local community in the emerging markets and get their understanding of how they view your product because then I think you can find a really good reception there. Yeah, and are there differences between uh, different outbound markets, for example, Europe and Asia? Do you well, see there also differences? Yeah, I mean, a lot of my research, of course, is focused on more broadly Asian, Asian travelers of, of millennial age, millennial generation. And something that's really occurred to me is um, are the products that we're sometimes proposing, especially if they focus around things like uh, you know, the, the aspects that have made gay destinations traditionally popular in Europe, are they necessarily appealing in the same way to, um, to gay travelers from the emerging markets? So we have to really think about what, what, whether what we understand as popular gay tourism products, about whether they really are meeting the needs and the interests of highly aspirational um, but highly eager, eager travelers for, for things like education. That's where I think like Vienna's, you know, and emphasizing the, you know, the romantic aspect of the destination and the classical flair of the destination. Uh, my understanding is that those kind of aspects may be more appealing. I'm, I'm interested to get your, your insights from Vienna on sort of what aspects have been of the city are most attractive to, to Asian travelers and if you have any insights on, on LGBT travelers from Asia. Well, um, I'm actually taking care of the US market and the UK market and of India. Mm. Um, but uh, for example, in India, we promote, uh, we don't promote LG, um, L uh, we don't address LGBT travelers. Um, however, um, what I see from also being in India and talking to the, to the travel trade uh, and, and to the yeah, to travel agents is that uh, Vienna is seen as as a romantic destination, as a honeymoon destination for Indian travelers, as a, a destination for families uh, uh, to come. And um, yeah, because we also had uh, several uh, Bollywood productions in Austria, that's also why a lot of Indian people are traveling uh, to, to Vienna and to Austria, and that's how we also promote, that's how uh, that, we use those images, you know, in our like online marketing, on banners, on uh, magazine inserts, uh, with more of the green Vienna uh, and romantic Vienna, or yeah, pictures with families on it. Something actually, there was an interesting point from what Thomas was saying, just mentioning online marketing. And we're talking about the challenges of what destinations have to face and how they're going to cater to different markets. I think there's a massive need, of course, to be able to, if you're a destination, act more these days as a, as a, con a concierge for visitors rather than doing perhaps huge amounts of promotion. But I mean, we, I found in my latest study on Asian travelers that 86% of travelers um, do their homework and discover what's going on in the destination when they arrive, they, they arrive at the hotel, then it's time to connect to the internet and, and discover what's going on and, and plan their trip. Um, so, of course, it corresponds to the authority, to, to people who are doing the marketing, to be in the right time at the right place and package some of those experiences, help people discover what gay options are available um, when, they're doing their, when they're doing their planning in the destination at that time. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, what, what is your, from your point of view, what is the, the challenge to reach the Asian market from other, the, like from the American or the European markets? What are the differences sure. in Asia? First of all, may I interject 
I really respect what Austria is doing by marketing in Eastern Europe. Because when a company or a destination acknowledges the LGBT community in those destinations which are less out, less welcomed, less embraced, it, it empowers them. And we've been doing a lot of research for a lot of corporations. There's a brand new television ad, I encourage you to YouTube it. It's uh, by McDonald's and it's being run in, tai in Taipei, in Taiwan. And the son writes on a coffee cup at McDonald's, I like boys, and he puts it in front of his father. And his father walks away, and the boy feels completely rejected. But the father comes back, and with a pen, he says, I acknowledge and appreciate you in Chinese on the cup and gives it back to the kid. And it just, it's so welcoming. And so when a company like McDonald's, love it or hate it, does that kind of acknowledgement of our community, it means the world. So I think what's going on in terms of that outreach in the lesser developed LGBT markets makes a huge difference. I can't speak for all of Asia. We did a China study. Even though China is a huge population, it's not all of Asia, and Asia is half the world, so I'm not trying to make assumptions. But from our China study, which I hope you'll download, first of all, it's younger. Okay, in the, in the Western markets, in Europe and in, in North America, it's really an older market because, you know, we kind of came out one or two generations ago. And it's, you know, we look at older travelers as having more money and more leisure time, more vacation, holiday time. But that's not the case in Asia. In Asia, the younger people are embracing and acknowledging that they're LGBT far more than the older. And the older may be LGBT, but they're probably married with kids and they don't have the opportunity to come out and travel as LGBT. It's also uh, very interesting that social pressure is very strong in the Asian markets, which keeps younger people from acknowledging to their parents and the older generation what's going on. It's a very online and very, very mobile market. So you can't think about you know, the classic print ads that we, want, we might use in the UK or, or Germany or in, in Canada. Um, it's really not the way to, to message. It's really all about being online, being on the mobile apps, and having a little banner uh, about your destination, where they are going to be. Um, and the top mobile apps and websites are in that study, so I encourage you to look at it. Also very interesting is that in the West, it's more of a gay male market than a lesbian market for all kinds of various reasons. But interestingly enough, in China, it's much more of a lesbian market than a gay male market. We find that lesbians feel more comfortable socially traveling together. So they're looking for a mid-market travel experience, whereas individual gay men who may not feel comfortable traveling together are more budget travelers. So it's really interesting, the nuance, when we put out these grids of younger gay men, middle-aged gay men, older, younger, middle-aged women, older women, it really does break out differently. The other consideration, of course, is passports and visas. Um, and it's very difficult for a Chinese gay or not traveler to get a visa even just to visit the USA. So that has to come into play, that they may not have a visa, they may not have a passport, and that kind of research needs to be done. So those are just some of the, the key findings. There's a lot more in the research, but thank you for asking that because there's lots of differences. Yeah, um, when it comes, uh, another question for the Asian market, where do you see the, uh, um, uh, the increase for outbound uh, markets in, in Asia, for example? Well, where, I think where all of them. Where do the next travelers coming from? Yeah, I think all that? of them. I think India is very big, yeah. um, and I think China, again, you know, considering the hurdles of passports and visas, is also very big, but Taiwan, I mean, there's just, it's, it's huge and honestly untapped. And any company or destination yeah. that steps out there yeah. is gonna be first to market like Amsterdam and, yeah. and, uh, and Montreal were in the United States 25 yeah. years ago. And what's about the Japanese market, what do you think? Because it's a, like a Western country. Absolutely, absolutely. But and there are more, ch more communication channels available in the Japanese market as but well. But right now we don't see really Japanese I travelers know. traveling around the world in, in LGBT tours. We don't see yeah. them yet, but it's not really... It's much more, I would say, much more closeted. 
Um, they're traveling, they're enjoying gay destinations, but they may be not as out as, you know, the flag-waving yeah. uh, okay. German tourist. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, German tourists are known for that, okay. I had no idea. Yeah, good. <laughs> good to know. Something, uh, something I, um, observation I've made in this, some of the studies I've done on Asia is just, you know, re remember from uh, studying uh, human geography at school and the famous population pyramid of, uh, of the, obviously the age composition that you get? Well, just take a look. There's a fantastic website, actually, called populationpyramid.net, um, and um, it's really fascinating to a quick snapshot because look at the population pyramid of countries like Vietnam and the Philippines. The Philippines is like this. It's an enormously youthful population, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to find, I think, in the next five or ten years Absolutely. that um, while it's, it's very difficult for Filipinos, too, to, to get visas, but mm -hmm. I think as, as economic development increases, yep. as spending increases, outbound markets like that, I think, are going to become important. It's an exciting time to find mm -hmm. your niche and to really embrace that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I want to go back to the, to, to the Eastern European market, because I think this is really interesting what Vienna did there. And you talked about what you, what uh, the... Uh, the, 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 uh, what you did in, the, in, the, in these markets will happen very well for you. But for example, you talked also about Czech Republic and Hungary. I know that you, tr uh, you wanted to work in the Russian market, but you decided not to do this because of, of course there are problems in the Eastern Europe. Yeah. So what, have, what did you see, what, Vienna, what saw the Vienna Tourist Board, where are the problems in the Eastern European market for you and that you decided, no, we don't do it then? Well, I would say, I mean, first of all, obviously the, the legal situation, political situation in those countries. And then furthermore, you have to find really r reliable partners that you can work with in those countries. Let it be uh, magazines, LGBT gay lesbian magazines or uh, websites, for example. And uh, so, yeah, those partners are somehow quite hard to find. Or when you thought you found someone and then suddenly like one or two months after that, you don't hear anything anymore. Uh, so this uh, happened in, in some, some cases, for example. Yeah. So that was definitely one, one, one challenge. But on the other side, uh, we also have a lot of really good working partners. For example, I was talking before that this year will be also the first time um, promoting Vienna in Japan as an LGBT travel destination. And that's why we're working very closely with the Austrian tourist office. They have also an office in Japan and they are also very much supporting um, us in, in, in this respect to, to market Vienna mm -hmm. there. And we'll be at, at Tokyo Pride actually with a Vienna. Oh, okay. Fantastic. We understand. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have also a question to Rika because when it comes to, to human rights, I think mm. we are really working on that. That uh, we, or we both think that gay uh, gay issues are really this, to be gay or lesbian is a human right. And um, what is the uh, from the CSR or human rights point of view? Where do you th uh, think are the biggest challenges here? Yeah, I think we can look at that from a general point of view because, you know, um, right now we have so many problems again on that earth. I mean, there's war, there's terrorism, there's uh, 60 million people on the move involuntarily, you know. So, and there's a lot of discrimination starting again from people against people. And this is not only for LGBT people, but that's for everybody. And I think what we really have to fight is um, a polarization. Because people tend to, there's really a tendency again to say, oh, you're a Muslim, you're a Jewish, you're I don't know what, you know, you're Christian, so, uh, or Buddhist, and I, I'm not your brother or I'm not your sister because of that. And this is this kind of polarization is most, uh, most dangerous. And I think so in one way we, we really have to, to incorporate the human rights movement into LGBT travel. Because, you know, there are so many um, um, helpful links from, from organizations who promote human rights and tourism or our roundtable for human rights, which we are a member, which can be adopted by the LGBT travel industry as well. And I think this will be a, 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 yeah, a good thing to, to think about it more, because we're not, it's not only us, it's many, many other people. Who are, and I was just saying that I was uh, talking about gender equality. Um, this is also uh, a fight we can all put up together, you know, and I think. That's important. I, I wonder whether also there's so many opportunities for businesses in the travel industry to support 
gay people themselves, LGBT people themselves, in that I think there's been a bit of a tendency as uh, marriage equality has, has spread, which is undoubtedly a good thing, but it's very easy to think that, okay, everything's sorted now, everything's, mm. everything's mm. fine. And yet there are uh, so many things uh, that uh, young uh, LGBT people growing up have to deal with, so many issues still, and of course so many seniors, which is of course a, you know, increasing in Europe and, and North America as well. And there are problems that people are going through. There are, um, and then obviously Rika just mentioned about F refugees. There are many LGBT refugees coming in too. And I believe that there are, it's, a, it's an ethical responsibility for the travel industry to step in and try and help propose solutions, not always offer money, but offer the resources that they have as well um, when, it, when it comes to it. Mm, okay, good. I think we are very good on time, so we still have some minutes for our questions from the audience. So, um, if there anybody is, has a question, feel free, yeah, please feel free to ask. Yes. Uh, my, my name is Jürgen Steinmetz from ETN in Honolulu, and uh, I have a question for Rika. Um, I'm wondering, you said something what really um, triggered my mind. You said uh, the LGBT community has the support for UNWTO. I thought, uh, besides um, uh, uh, IGLTA being a member, um, there isn't really much support. It's nowhere mentioned. Same with WTTC. I know WTTC will be attending the event in Cape Town, um, but it's a good thing. But other than that, I don't see any support. I just actually came back from an event next door for a few minutes for Empowering <laughs> Women, um, and uh, the Secretary General was there among uh, many others. I don't think I've seen them at an event like this before. So how, how can you, how, how did you base your decision uh, to say that UNWTO is most supportive? Well, um, I know that with IJLTA, they made a report on LGBT travel, and that was groundbreaking, because, I mean, at that time, you were still working with UNWTO, Peter, wasn't you? And they're now doing a new one. Yeah, and they are now doing a new one. So this is, of course, it might not be, you know, the Secretary General speaking out loud. You have to respect every person, but... Um, there is a movement within the UNWTA supporting it. There are a lot of people in Madrid who have welcomed us very well when we were having the IGLTA convention in Madrid. And also uh, at FITUR, there were people really supporting um, from the UNWTO meeting us at some of the network uh, events. And there are those guidelines I was just um, mentioning. And at least we have to fill those guidelines, of course, with life. And uh, it's, it's, it's rather LGBT travel segment which has to, to fight for it than uh, waiting for others to do it. Yeah. So, but I think it's, it's a door. It's, it's a, it ha the door has been opened. Yeah, the door is open, but the support is here. Well, we can ask for more support. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good start. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it is, probably. Okay. More questions? Don't be shy. We have a microphone. I think that way. No questions. If we say that, no one's going to. OK. Do you have anything or do you want to add here from your point of view? After you Final, follow all remarks. Um, yeah, I, again, I, th I think um, in, instead, I think it's very easy in LGBT marketing. Again, I'm, I haven't been directly involved uh, in it through my work, but I, I do a huge amount of research in the other emerging areas in the travel industry. Um, I also observe a lot, and this comes from my work with UNWTO in, in the past, is observing what are the major challenges that destinations have to deal with? What keeps the decision makers really awake at night? Well, I think in, instead of getting introspective and worrying all the time about the specifics of gay marketing, I think it's we really get allies and uh, we get attention by pro coming and proposing solutions to some of those wider problems in destination management and marketing. And I'd like to add the opportunities really in LGBT marketing from here on out is in the diversity within LGBT. Look at the different segments within LGBT. Look at the transgender community. Look at the people of color. Look at the uh, different age categories. Maybe you'd be more successful with the lesbian community than the gay male community. You may be first to market by placing an ad that includes two women versus all the other ads that include two men. There's so many different chances out there to be successful. So don't feel like, oh, it's just too big and too expensive. I can't even start. Break it up into smaller opportunities and, and approach it that way. Okay. 
Yeah, I think that was really interesting. I just so, uh, want to say that um, now that we finish, we just don't need to go everybody on his own. There is a little networking event. It's called the Responsible <coughs> Tourism Networking Event, but I think you should be part of that community. So we can go to 4.1. There is a little Responsible Tourism Networking event going on for about two hours. So it would be nice to have you there as well. Okay. Thank you. So thank you very much. So I want to ask Mr. Professor Schmude to close the session officially. <laughs> thank you. Vielen Dank. Uh, ein herzliches Dankeschön vor allen Dingen an Sie, dass Sie am Freitagnachmittag so lange ausgeharrt haben. Wir sind am Ende des Destination Day 3 angekommen. Wir haben sieben thematisch sehr unterschiedliche Slots gehabt. Wir haben aber spannende Diskussionen gehabt, auch die letzte Diskussion hier durchaus erfrischend, auch am Freitag. Nachmittag. Wir haben jetzt gerade die Einladung für den nächsten Event gehabt. Ich wünsche Ihnen noch einen guten Aufenthalt auf der ITB. Ich wünsche Ihnen eine gute Heimreise, sei es heute, morgen oder dann am Sonntag. Und hoffe, dass wir uns alle gesund und munter im nächsten Jahr hier wiedersehen. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you.